Distinguished guests and fellow colleagues, welcome to today's CLC lecture series. My name is Victoria and I'm from the Centre for Livable Cities. The Centre was jointly established by the Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of the Environment and Water Resources in 2008 to distill, create and share knowledge on livable and sustainable cities. The Centre was uh, the CLC Lecture Series is one of the platforms through which urban thought leaders and international experts share best practices and exchange ideas and experiences. In today's session, we have, we are honoured to have with us Mr. Joe Barrich, partner at the Urban Strategies Incorporation, who will share his experiences in planning major city centres and waterfronts around the world, including Singapore. The format for today's lecture will start off with a 45-minute presentation by Mr. Barrich, followed by a Q&A session with the audience, which will be moderated by Mr. Ching Tuan Yi, Director of Urban Planning and Design at the Urban Redevelopment Authority. Without further ado, let us start this session by, st by inviting Mr. Barrich on stage. Mr. Barrich, please. Thank you, Victoria. We discovered in chatting beforehand that we both went to the same university, so there we are. The, uh, <laughs> eventually, uh, all good things come to pass. Um, I'm delighted to be here today uh, and have a chance to uh, really have, a, I think, a conversation with you, which is what I'd really like to do. Um, I'll, I'll start off with some, uh, some thoughts and observations on the various projects that we've been working on, uh, some in Singapore, some elsewhere. Um, but then I think what would be good is to have a really uh, a fruitful Q&A about how do you really plan big city centers and waterfronts? And I want to talk about the first word there, planning. I'm a planner, not an architect. Uh, and there is a big, big difference. And planning, everybody thinks of being a kind of all to do with policy and zoning bylaws and floor space indices and stuff like that. I think planning is about something far more fundamental, uh, which is what is the real reason for a project? How does this project live well in your city? Uh, and it's those kind of big questions that I think I, I wanted to start off with. Um, and let's talk, I'll do it by talking a little bit about Singapore. Uh, the biggest question that you should always ask when you go, we, we go and travel in a lot of, uh, of cities, and I've just come from Sydney, uh, helping them with their, the, the next phase of, of the Sydney Harbour uh, development. Um, and the question they're asking themselves is, where in the world are we as a city? Because that should start to frame what we should be doing with these very big, very important, very well located sites. So it's always fun to kind of run through, and uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with all of these ranking systems. I teach at the University of Toronto, and uh, the first course, the first uh, my new students is I, I say, what rank is Toronto? Um, so what rank is, is Singapore in the world? Uh, and when you see there, the, there's a globalization of world cities ranking, which is the one that a lot of academics think is a pretty good ranking system, and basically, Singapore is the fifth most important, significant, whatever you want to call it, uh, city in the world. Um, that is a pretty extraordinary achievement, given the fact of the size of your country, which is the same as the size of your city, uh, but also when you start to look at what the, the competition is. Um, when, what are the drivers of being a, a successful city? Uh, you need no education on this. Essentially, financial services are absolutely critical. Uh, and uh, New York and London are way ahead of anybody else. But then there's a pretty tight cluster of other cities uh, that are searching to be the most important in terms of, uh, of, of financial services. And you can see here uh, the current ranking. Um, and what's fascinating about that is I suspect that that's a fairly unstable ranking uh, in the sense that it's not at all clear to me what Hong Kong's long-term future as the third most important uh, global center in the world is going to be. Uh, it's certainly clear that Shanghai will not stay the 20th most important in the world. Uh, it's not clear where Tokyo is going to go. So there's a lot of instability in that. Now, why am I going on about financial services? Because there are very few fundamental things that drive the economy of modern cities. Uh, uh, Richard Florida, anybody, everybody know who Richard Florida is? The great, good, 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 creative cities guy. Um, it, he's made this very astute observation, which is that the world, the urban world, is becoming very spiky. Few and few, fewer and fewer cities are more and more important. 
um, that, that just in the same way that the income distribution is getting spiky, so city significance is getting spiky. Uh, and financial service is the spikiest industry of all. But what it brings with it is a huge number of uh, ancillary professional and business services, and frankly, the businesses that we're all in, uh, planning, development, architecture, very much are dragged along by the energy of that dynamic. Whether we like it or not, that is one of the fundamental building blocks uh, of the modern city. Um, what's the second fundamental building block? Brains. Uh, I, I have to say that when we worked on Greater Southern Waterfront uh, and the, uh, the magnificent Mrs. Chung, uh, 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 after we'd won the competition, she sat us down and she said, okay, you've won this competition. Now I want to tell you about Singapore. She said, we have no oil, we have no gas, we have no water, uh, we have no agriculture, we have no resources. What we have is brains. And uh, it, what's fascinating is it's obviously true for Singapore, but it's also true for every other major city in the world. There ain't no oil rigs in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, there, there, you know, there, there aren't no, there's no agriculture in the middle of Sydney. Uh, all major modern cities have is brains. And what you have done, again, we'll take these rankings. Uh, every single one of these rankings you can say is rubbish, but when you start to individually, but when you start to look at them together, they actually start to tell you uh, a collective story. Um, National University of Singapore is uh, 22nd, just only, only two behind my, uh, where I teach. Um, but the highest in Asia Pacific. That's not, it, it is incredibly hard to be the 22nd uh, most significant university in the world. Let me tell you, you have to work like crazy to get there and to stay there. So this is a very impressive thing and again uh, uh, suggests an understanding that Singapore has about what it takes uh, to make you uh, competitive. Um, interestingly, third most important thing is connectivity. Now this is a slightly hard drawing to understand but I love it so you can put up with it. Um, this is how many places can you fly to non-stop basically. Uh, and you'll see the two green uh, squares in the middle there, New York, London. Um, they have the highest connectivity ranking. But then there is uh, my hometown, Toronto, Paris, Mexico City, uh, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and Singapore. Uh, very important because essentially cities are trading. A successful city is a trading city. A trading city has to be a connected city. Uh, and so your airport is an absolutely fundamental piece of infrastructure equipment for the success of a city. Uh, and obviously this map, which I adore, uh, is uh, the water connectivity as well. Uh, and being whatever you are, second or third most important port in the world is, is hugely significant. So this is a lot, what school has got to do with architecture and planning? It has a tremendous amount to do because essentially it is these economic drivers that create the prosperity, the wealth, the jobs, the activity, uh, the immigration, uh, the tourism, all those uh, things that actually create the society uh, and the building and the development that we have to plan. Um, it's also all about people. Uh, it's not just a physical question. Um, it's fascinating when you start to look into these slightly qualitative indices. Uh, this is the PricewaterhouseCoopers Cities of Opportunity. And again, there are quite a few of these kinds of rankings, but uh, it's fascinating to look at this. Um, and what you see here is that Singapore uh, ranks third overall in terms of Cities of Opportunity. Uh, I hate to say just one ahead of Toronto. Um, but uh, you are clearly a gateway city airports, uh, marine. Uh, you've got superb, in fact, the best transport and infrastructure in the world. Uh, and, and I have to say, I, I am knocked out by uh, the quality of your, your public uh, uh, transit system here. Um, economic clout, you're doing pretty good on. Demographics and livability, you perhaps don't rank so high. Uh, and this is a, you know, an observation. Every city has their ups and their downs, and it's clear uh, that in, uh, you know, there you're you're behind the, 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 the Sydney's and even Hong Kong and certainly New York, London, uh, London etc. Um, just recently, the uh, economic, Economist Intelligence Unit came out with a livability ranking. Uh, this is sounding like a talk about Toronto, but what the heck? Uh, we're number one. Um, and, uh, but the 
uh, Singapore is significantly down the list there. So it's interesting when you look at this in, in a, uh, again in a, an Asia-Pacific uh, context, again, there's a whole series of Asia-Pacific cities that, according to The Economist and what do they know, uh, have a higher quality of livability than, uh, than Singapore does. Um, so when you've asked the question about where are you in the world, you then have to ask the question, where are we in the city? And this is uh, uh, Sydney uh, and Sydney Harbor, uh, where uh, I've just come from there because we're helping them uh, with the development of, the, of their kind of back waterfront. And what they have done is exactly the same analysis that I just gave you for Singapore. They did that exact analysis for, for Sydney. And not surprisingly, it's reversed. They are one of the most livable, glorious beach climate lovely eating cities in the world, but the airport's rubbish, uh, their, their financial service sector isn't very strong, uh, their global competitiveness is not that high. So what the, the, the task that we had uh, with them was essentially to try and give a prescription as to what should they be doing, um, particularly in this back area. Everybody knows about the, uh, the Opera House, which is in the foreground, Sydney Harbour Bridge in the middle, um, but this old port uh, which is about 80 hectares, uh, is now basically redundant. And so the question is, what should they do there? Uh, and what they have essentially said is what we should do here is what fills the gaps of our city offering uh, as a globally competitive city. And I think that's a very interesting way to think about what a city should be doing in the macro. You have a cold, hard look at what you do for a living, what you do well, what you do less well. And when you have these big strategic sites, you say to yourself, let's figure out what we can uh, do there to fill that gap. Um, we'll go to Manchester, where we've worked for a long, long time. Uh, and interestingly, here is their redundant port, Salford Keys, in the, in the center of town, quite a distance from the city center. Uh, and this distance is always a problem that you have to deal with uh, in, these, uh, in these developments. So we've been helping them now over about 25 years uh, at figure out how to create a there there about a mile away from the center. Uh, and you'll see in the foreground there uh, two uh, big cultural buildings, the Imperial War Museum and the uh, Lowry Center. Um, but what really made this happen was the attraction of a major uh, development, cultural development, the BBC, who brought about uh, 2,000 direct jobs, probably another 2,000 indirect jobs. Uh, and that, in turn, created the demand for transit. Uh, and now that whole area has taken off. Um, one of the things that, uh, this is why I'm a planner, not an architect. You talk to a planner, the first thing they'll talk about is walkability, texture, grain, uh, d design, uh, uh, massing, etc. Nonsense. The first thing you've got to talk about is create a there there. Create a reason for people to go, and when you create a reason to, for people to go, create a way that they can go. Uh, so it's a critical mass and connectivity uh, go ahead. Of, you don't get design unless you get critical mass and connectivity first. Fascinating looking at uh, a, a project that we haven't had any direct involvement with, but uh, very comparable uh, problem. Uh, Mission Bay in, in San Francisco, the old abandoned port, uh, and there's a city center in the back, about, again, about a mile away. Uh, this was a scheme that, uh, there, there have been probably three or four schemes for this over the last 20 years, every one of which has won uh, all the urban design awards in the world, none of which happened. Uh, why didn't they happen? Because of that problem. There was no there there. It wasn't until uh, the University of California, San Francisco came along with a very strong biomedical uh, uh, direction that created in turn a, a, a series of privately sponsored biomedical research facilities. That in turn drew transit, uh, drew, drew housing there, uh, uh, lovely housing on the uh, China Basin, uh, and then uh, the light rail and also sports facilities. Uh, you need to think about these big sites in this very uh, strong demand creating way. When you create demand, make sure you can service demand. Uh, in Toronto, we've spent, again, the last 20 years trying to figure out what to do with our abandoned port. You see a whole series of abandoned ports here because uh, someone, there's a, a lovely phrase about, um, it's called the retreat of the industrial glacier. Uh, containerization essentially was the retreat of, the of one mode of industrial activity, one mode of transportation. And when containerization happened, all of these ports became uh, redundant 
in a heartbeat. Uh, and it's taken a lot of places, including my city, a long time to figure out what to do with them. Again, you can see the distance between the city center in the back uh, and the portlands in the foreground here. Um, what we have been doing here for the last uh, 20 years is essentially trying to find those elements of critical mass. And very slowly, we are dragging the center out uh, with George Brown College, which is a, a major uh, educational institution, uh, and using these kinds of chess pieces very uh, carefully to create the, 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 uh, the momentum and direction for a, a wider scale redevelopment. So what are those big chess pieces that we have uh, to deal with? What are the components of, of big projects? Um, I always say they're actually not just the big things. You really always need to have big things to make big things happen. Um, so you do need to think about those crucial uh, big king and queen chess pieces. But then you also want to think about your knights and your rooks and your bishops, your mid-sized pieces that complement that. Uh, and then every project needs a ton of pawns uh, because that's what gives the texture and the feel and the, and, and the grain uh, to, to any development. Um, so let's go through a little bit about what those are. Uh, the most important uh, driver, I think, I in the modern economy are universities um, because they are essentially the... The, the, the factory of the new economy. They make brains. Um, and, and I think probably, and I don't know, I have no idea what your uh, educational decision-making thinking uh, strategic is in, in, uh, in Singapore. You have one major university. Uh, you probably will need another one uh, at some point. And you want to think about where and what that is. Because universities do, as I say, they make the brains, but they are also phenomenally important in terms of uh, maintaining uh, a very high level of in-migration. Because essentially, uh, so many students want to come to a university, uh, you have a fantastic opportunity to keep the ones you want and uh, let the others go, go, go back home. Uh, and it's, it sounds very calculating, but frankly, uh, immigration is one of the critical dynamics for a spiky city. Uh, and so you want to manage this as, as in a calculating fashion as you can. Um, it's fascinating uh, watching what's happened in London, England, where the, uh, this is the Olympic site, and in front you see the Olympic Village uh, and some of the uh, sports facilities. What do they do with that big site? They've been filling it full of universities. Queen Mary College is going out there. Uh, Imperial College is going out there. Uh, there are a whole series of new educational institutions to create an educational campus on this formerly uh, derelict site. Um, the next big driver, as I said before, are financial services. Financial services are like a Faustian pact. Uh, they create income inequality. They create all kinds of peoples with very expensive cars uh, and demanding tastes, but they generate a huge amount of spin-off. Um, they're also uh, very important in terms, if you can do this cleverly, again, of being one of those big dr drivers of a remote site. Um, we worked uh, with uh, the Canadian development company, Olympia and York, who were the initial developers of uh, Canary Wharf. And I remember going out there the first time uh, when they hired us to help them. Uh, and basically, there was just absolutely nothing, 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 nothing on the site at all. There was, and, there, and to get there, you had to go down this sort of narrow alleyway of streets. And they said, oh, we're going to do 10 million square feet of uh, high-end uh, high office. And I went, OK. Um, but uh, they did it. They did it by hook, hook and by crook. They dragged transit out there. They created a place there. And what you realize now is that having created that whole new destination in East London, uh, they were able uh, to lever the confidence for things like the Olympics and all of the other wonderful initiatives, uh, the, the, the O2 Dome, et cetera, et cetera, that London have been able to do. Without that uh, Canary Wharf um, uh, uh, a leap in the dark, uh, none of that reversal of uh, London's growth to the west to turn into London's growth to the east, I think, would have happened. Um, so it's, it's one of these fascinating things, again, as, as a planner, you know, one thing about planners is that, we, you know, we're very ordered and polite and we balance our checkbook every month and we go forward step by step by step by step. Uh, it's not actually how cities are built. Um, uh, cities are built, I think, by great dynamic projects leaps in the dark that then change momentum, um, especially on these, uh, on these fringe uh, uh, abandoned industrial and port sites. Um, 
The other uh, drivers, uh, these big corporate centers, uh, it's fascinating again in, um, in, in Sydney, uh, there aren't any major head offices of high-tech high IT uh, companies. This is something they've identified as being a, a gap in Sydney's offer. So uh, they look very uh, much at the Amazon headquarters in Seattle, Google uh, uh, headquarters uh, in, near San Francisco, uh, and they are now figuring out how do we get that, how do we pull one of these uh, big tenants in, again, to create that critical mass. Um, research complexes, uh, again, you need no education on this. I, I talk about Biopolis everywhere I go. I think this is one of the most extraordinary initiatives uh, that I know anywhere. Uh, and I love the way that you are turning this into uh, Fusionopolis and Mediopolis and Digitopolis and all the other opolises that I can't quite keep up with. But uh, it is a, this is exactly the right thing to be doing. Um, we've got a, 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 another project that, that I'm very uh, ad admiring of is what New York City did. Um, this is the uh, Cornell University scheme, uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, probably one of the best mayors has ever been in a major city, uh, identified the, the gap in New York City's offer, that it didn't have a really good science and engineering <coughs> university. So being Bloomberg, he said, I'll go and buy one. Um, so he offered a whole series of sites uh, around uh, the, the East River, uh, and he offered 100 million seed corn, um, and he got fantastic bidding, and eventually Cornell uh, won the opportunity. Uh, we've been trying to do the same thing in Toronto with MARS, stands for Medical and Related Sur uh, Sciences, uh, with a uh, uh, now 2 million square foot, essentially this is Biopolis, uh, and what we're now trying to figure out is how we do Fusionopolis and, and Digitalopolis and Nanopolis and Meteoropolis and all the rest of them. Uh, now, other big things, other tricks that big cities have played very cleverly. Uh, destinations. Um, it used to be that everybody wanted to have Disney or a theme park. Uh, I think that's a little passe now. Uh, and also the demands of those kinds of things don't fit well within the city. So a clever city, Chicago is a very clever city, uh, can find a way of uh, actually creating uh, out of open space, public space, fantastic public art, uh, fantastic event management, uh, a, a destination that actually becomes a, a placemaker. And for those of you who know who, uh, where this is in Chicago, this is on basically over their old rail yards. But more importantly, it filled a, an empty void between the city proper uh, and, uh, and the waterfront uh, and, and did that very cleverly. Um, and this lovely Gary uh, auditorium in the back there. Now, you need no education on this again. I am knocked out by Gardens on the Bay. I was wandering around it last time I was here in November. Uh, and uh, it is a, what I love about it is that it is an extraordinary, uh, utterly original architectural and design and landscape achievement. It's, it, it's really beautiful. It's also quite funny. Um, and it's so rare to have massive projects. There's, there's a real sense of humor. I mean, there's a sense of humor about these uh, glorious trees, but uh, I love how the way, even at, at a micro level, there, there, are all, there are all these sort of gargoyles and carvings when you're walking around uh, that you don't notice until you notice them, and you see they're everywhere. Uh, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, no, and uh, I'm trying to get my city to do a similar thing, not quite the same climate. Um, and obviously we know culture, this is a, the more traditional driver, but very effective. Oslo, have, uh, which is not a very big city with not a very driving economy, have done fantastically well in igniting their old port with this absolutely glorious opera house. Uh, uh, Boston are doing the same in, in Fan Pier, just uh, uh, some removed from their city center. Um, I'm working away in, in my, I was, I was uh, born in Wales, so I'm having the joy of going back to my old uh, natal city and discovered when I was researching it, actually, that my great uncle and great great uncle built half of these docklands. So, so it's one of these, you have to get old enough to actually be able to revisit these things, but it's a, a glorious thing. Um, and there we've, we've we had the same problem of uh, uh, Cardiff Bay, uh, which is the only other uh, tidal barrage bay in the world that I know of, by the way, so it's one thing you, it shares with Singapore. Um, they started off very boldly with a lot of public money. Uh, it, it's been very hard to make it happen, uh, largely because of this, again, this tricky distance from the city center down to the bay. Uh, so we've been working with them uh, on, a, on a new plan uh, and just figuring out how it is that they can begin to develop around and create more of, of a place there. Um, the thing that they are missing, which every city has to understand and grasp with is waterfront transportation. Uh, and that's what we're trying to put into Cardiff to make sure that uh, that actually happens. 
Um, well, just on transportation, it's fascinating to me. Almost every city that we're working in right now is in looking at this, at the cable car. Um, it seems as if the technology of cable cars, uh, you can get about 4,000, 5,000 people an hour. So it's not an LRT, but it's a darn good bus route. Um, and uh, they're getting to be quite cheap. Uh, and they're actually getting to be privately financeable. So there's quite an interesting breakthrough, I think, happening uh, in, in, in that. So you can see here in, in London that wonderful uh, piece of missing link uh, in the uh, London underground system uh, being put across the, the Thames River. So we talked a lot about big. Um, as important are, uh, when you've got those big things, you just don't want to do big things and stand there you know, with nothing around you. Uh, you want to make sure that you've got some kind of texture. Uh, and I think one of the things in Toronto that we've been very successful in doing is combining heritage uh, and texture uh, to create these very interesting uh, places. You're not quite sure what they are. They're partly uh, heritage. Um, they're partly retail. Um, they're partly arts. Uh, and these are all old uh, buildings dotted around the city that uh, we've been fixing. Uh, they're partly a kind of natural environment. Um, and this is the borough market in London, uh, and also food. That combination of heritage, arts, culture, uh, uh, restoration, food, uh, activity, nature, uh, is a very potent mix. And you can draw, you can collectively, you turn it into a, a different kind of destination that isn't uh, the big destination that I spoke of earlier, but has a kind of urban authenticity to it, uh, kind of a, a almost a, 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 a hyped authenticity, if that's possible, uh, that is a very, makes a very interesting place. Uh, other quick things that we've been looking at that uh, people are doing, we looked at the big Biopolis things, very expensive, very high rents. There's a real market for cheap, cheerful, friendly space. This is an old television factory in Manchester that's been turned into a place where your office is a cargo container. Uh, and you rent it by the day, by the week, by the month, by the year, uh, stupidly cheap. Uh, and there's a ping pong table in the middle of the, of the floor and, a, and, a, and a, uh, a cafe bar. And that's what makes an environment. Same things happened in London with the old uh, uh, Olympic uh, uh, Telecommunications Center, uh, a huge barn of a building that's been turned into super cheap space for startup. Uh, you've got to remember in the world that pharma and big engineering drive Biopolis and Nanopolis, um, but kids drive Meteoropolis and uh, kids with no money in their pockets who want to do a startup business. So you've got to make sure that you create that kind of space for them. And the modern economy, I think, is turning more to this kind of space than it is to that very high cost, uh, uh, high service space. Okay, so we did big, we did medium, small. Um, this is one of my favorite projects in the whole world. Uh, this is a place that is so far, but so, uh, so near, but so far. This is 800 meters from Manhattan, 500 meters from uh, Brooklyn, um, the Governor's Island. Uh, you, if any of you have been on the Staten Island Ferry, you'd go past it all the time, but you never knew it was there. None of you have ever been there, I suspect, unless you've been there very recently. Um, it was an old military base, uh, and uh, we could, we ran all kinds of calls to try and get universities and research people and other things and hotels to come out here. None of them would because you can't hang those things just off a ferry. It just doesn't work. Um, so we said, well, let's just start really small. So we created parks, but hyper parks, parks with hammocks, uh, parks with uh, kayaks, parks with all kinds of uh, entertainment. Let everything happen very quickly. And what's happened here is that it used to have a visitation of 14,000 a year uh, when we started, and we're now up to over half a million a year. Uh, and ju that's just summer visitation. So it's amazing how much fun uh, can be a driver. Um, similar park, uh, this is Brooklyn Bridge Park, uh, where again, our firm were the initial designers. Uh, slightly more intense activity here, uh, slightly more organized recreation, lots of sports teams, lots of sports events, but it shows how critical sports can be in terms of being a driver. Um, and don't forget about the absolutely fundamental things, walking, cycling, sitting. Uh, these, if you create connected uh, walkways, as again, you know well in this city, uh, it's amazing how much activity they will get to. There's one thing I, I missed out at largely because I just also came from Manchester. Uh, this is any Manchester City supporters here? No? Any Manchester United supporters here? Cover your eyes, okay. Um, 
This is uh, Manchester City's uh, amazing training ground. Uh, their, their main stadium, Etihad uh, Stadium, is, is in the, the back there, just getting a, a new stand extended. Um, this is 16 soccer pitches, uh, uh, grade level, one uh, uh, 7,000 uh, uh, stadium, and another a secret soccer pitch, indoor and outdoor, where the uh, city can practice all their moves to beat United. Um, and uh, I hadn't realized what a business sports is. And I think increasingly I want to add it to that uh, sense of, of things being really significant drivers uh, to urban regeneration. And then I wanted to just pause for a minute here and let you all cool off. Um, this is sports, real sports here. This is 24 natural ice hockey rinks um, in just north of Toronto. And I'm going to pause and take a, you can all cool off when you see that. I have to say, I had a conversation with uh, CNN, everybody knows, uh, the other day, and I calculated that the, uh, as a phone video conversation, that the temperature difference between the both ends of the line was 54 degrees. Um, <laughs> so, okay, let's talk about uh, urban strategies in Singapore. Um, we have had a, a wonderful time working in your wonderful city. Um, first job that we worked on uh, was the Greater Southern Waterfront. Um, we worked on uh, Pongol, a, a master plan for Pongol. Both of these were competitions which we were lucky enough to win, uh, as I think was, was Bidadari. I, I wasn't personally involved in Bidadari, but uh, that too, uh, which is now under construction. And we've also done uh, a little work uh, just across the way. Um, I'm going to take you through very quickly these three schemes, uh, just to give you a sense of, um, of, of how they worked out. But I, I absolutely want to give first a health warning on these. These are not schemes that have been approved or adopted by anybody. Uh, they have moved on uh, in, in their own in, in independent way, uh, which is great. I think we were useful in, in making that happen. But So uh, nobody should take a note and say, that's the holy writ. They want such and such and such a, uh, here. Uh, these are, I think, ideograms uh, rather than plans. Um, so here is your port. Uh, now, you're still going like crazy in this port, but it bears a lot of similarities to those ports that I showed you earlier uh, on the edge uh, of a city center. Uh, and the decision, I think, has now been made uh, essentially to retire this port uh, and move it over to the west. Uh, and immediately, you can then see what an incredible urban asset you have. Um, we had a wonderful time, as CNN and uh, others are working away on this. It was a, a, a multi-stage competition and, and a very interactive one with uh, URA staff and, and, and really uh, uh, a hugely uh, helpful and rewarding process. Um, we looked at the entire area uh, of, uh, of the waterfront. You can see basically in white is new development, gray is existing. Um, but clearly it's too big an area to treat as one. So we broke it up into a whole series of neighborhoods and districts. Um, out at the, the far west, uh, Labrador Park, essentially very calm, very much an expansion of the existing ecological area uh, and a very pleasant residential environment around that. Uh, as we moved uh, to the east, uh, to the cruise uh, ship terminal, the old terminal, um, there's a real opportunity, we thought, here to do something very interesting, uh, actually, was to put back some floating housing. It's fascinating how many cities, again, are thinking about floating housing. Uh, and uh, given, obviously, the cultural tradition in Singapore, this seemed a wonderful thought of kind of reinventing this in a, in a modern idiom. Um, Pular Brani in the ring, um, and this is uh, sort of opposite Sentosa, where we thought there was a real opportunity here to uh, build between the Vivo, uh, what we're calling the ring on the end of Pular Brani, and Sentosa to create a really kind of hyped, hot kid activity uh, uh, a place um, somewhere I would never go to anymore, but all of you folk would. Um, and uh, just to give that sense of real excitement, uh, a, a lot of problem I have with a lot of waterfront planning is it's awfully proper and calm and considered and ecological and sustainable and all that stuff. It also ought to be a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, so that's what we were trying to do here. Um, then we saw uh, uh, to the east of that essentially the opportunity to extend the university district with, as I say, some major new universities that you don't even know you need yet, but I assure you, you do, uh, coming down uh, and, and uh, to the south of uh, NUS. Um, and this, again, would uh, be a place that would be very accessible. We're talking about a whole water transportation system uh, within this area. The North Keppel neighborhood, frankly, a more traditional, uh, probably high-end, 
a mid-rise uh, uh, residential area, uh, and some real opportunities there to create a, a different housing form from the housing form that you, you characteristically uh, have been building. Um, then we created this thing called Spin Island. Spin Island doesn't exist right now. The current shoreline are those two hard lines on either side. Um, but uh, frankly, you need that much water if you're going to be a port. You don't want that much water if you're going to be a neighborhood. So we thought there's a real opportunity to, to drop an island in the middle. Um, the other practical matter is that there's a heck of a lot of excavation going on, They're trying to bury the expressway, etc. So you'll have a huge amount of excavate. So there was a real opportunity here to, to have a convenient local uh, place to dispose of that excavate. And whenever anybody says, well, what are you going to do on Spin Island? I always say, I don't know. But it's fantastic to have a very big area that you don't know what you're going to do with in a city. Let's say you want to bid on the Olympics, which I hope you don't, but let's say you did. Uh, this is where you can do it. Let's say you want to world, uh, bid on the World Cup, which I hope you do, and I hope that would be wonderful. Uh, this is where you do it. You need to have, especially in this incredibly uh, wonderfully crowded island, you need to have a bit of relaxation space and, and, and relief space. So essentially that's what we were creating, a very big new active park in this area. Uh, as we came to the west of that, we saw a, a canal district. That's a, a grand canal you can see curving around there. Uh, that's a canal that actually sits right on top of the buried expressway. Um, and so we thought rather than doing what people typically do, which is to create a park on top of the expressway, a la Boston, uh, why don't you create a canal uh, so that you could actually create uh, a really interesting spine canal, but also a lot of uh, wonderful uh, residential water access neighborhoods on either side. And then we get to uh, the extension of the financial center, essentially of Marina Bay to the south, um, driven by that long uh, green axis there, uh, what we call Asia Boulevard, uh, that takes you right from Marina Bay down to uh, the, the southern waterfront, uh, which would also be an appropriate place for some major cultural buildings at the end of that. Um, so what we had done before we did this competition was exactly that big, medium, and small analysis. So we're saying, what does Singapore need? Uh, and we said it needs local, regional, and international destinations, big, medium, and small. Uh, and so we identified a whole series of places, and I won't go into them in detail, about where uh, cultural buildings, recreational activities, educational destinations, uh, uh, entertainment, uh, and cultural facilities could be located essentially to give, make sure that every one of those uh, district, new districts didn't have a single use or monolithic character, but they had the kind of the mix and texture that makes a great city. Um, and at the same time, clean, blue, green. There are wonderful opportunities in the world now. Uh, and any of you who've been to Stockholm will know the extraordinary uh, innovations that they are making with, with waste handling, energy use. Uh, there's a real opportunity to radically reduce car utilization in this area. Uh, and uh, so there's, you can have a huge amount of innovative fun uh, in this district. Um, and parks, public realm, water's edge, absolutely critical. Extend uh, Mount Faber out uh, across into Pulau Barney uh, and extend a whole series of other uh, water's edges all the way around. Uh, and here's that Grand Canal um, that runs through is essentially the trying to bring the sense of water deep into the interior of the site. And there we have it at night. So that's essentially, uh, again, a proposition that we put forward, I think now four or five years ago. Um, and uh, I, I'm happy to see when I go out in, uh, to the Marina Bay uh, showroom that some uh, versions of this are, are out there uh, suggesting that this is the direction that uh, Singapore wants to go. So uh, the second project I want to talk about is Bidadari. Um, and this, uh, I, I want to make sure by the way, that uh, I, I should give proper credit. Uh, the the uh, previous scheme, we worked with Bureau Happold uh, and with uh, uh, Philip Svervag Smallenberg. Uh, and uh, it's very important that it wasn't just uh, us. On, on this scheme, Bidadari, uh, we worked with Arup and with uh, MK, MKPL. I don't know if anybody is here from them. Great firm. Um, and uh, so this is uh, a very different project. And I should say on this one that I personally didn't work on that. I worked on this and on Pungal. Um, but uh, this was an opportunity, essentially, uh, you know, right in the middle of, uh, of of Singapore, where you had an opportunity to turn what was essentially a central open space or park uh, to uh, a, a community in a garden, in a park. Um, Binadari is very much at a crossroads in the centre of the city, uh, and the six 
big moves were essentially to try and bring that surrounding city into uh, the center uh, by essentially creating a, a lattice uh, of open spaces. This is something we think is really important, open space planning. Uh, this is basically Olmsted's big ideas. Um, everybody thinks that Olmsted was uh, the, uh, just the designer of Central Park, which obviously he was, but actually he was very much a designer of uh, a tremendous number of neighborhoods right across uh, Canada and uh, the United States. Uh, and he used this basic lexicon of creating a framework of open spaces, then adding in the roads that made sense to that, then adding the neighborhoods that were defined by that. And with that fine grain that you see here, not the thick grain that you see in too many uh, modern developments, and that enables you to create those very special places. So you get a sense now of the way we try and work, which is to layer the master plan of, of, of open space, of neighborhoods, of street pattern, uh, of special places. And that gave rise to this uh, master plan framework. Um, the moving around in terms of transportation very much, you can see here both road uh, and uh, a, a walkway and essentially ways in which you could cross uh, the, 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 these major roadways with walkways. Uh, in terms of public realm, um, a series of very different fields, the Serpentine, uh, the Park Drive, Cascade, the Rain Garden, uh, and uh, a new lake in the center, uh, and very much trying to lace these open spaces through uh, the entire uh, neighborhood to create that sense of nobody being very far uh, from a, a quality uh, green and open space. And then what that did was it began to give you this frame for a very major intensification in terms of uh, redevelopment. Uh, and clearly it's not just open space, it's the whole series of pedestrian walkways that go with you. And as I said, that gives you then the frame for a kind of a prototypical block pattern uh, where you have to solve for all the old corny hard problems of, of parking and access and density and height uh, and make them work in a co coherent way. Exactly the same problems we faced when we were uh, looking uh, at Pongal. Um, and again, uh, this is one that we did with our, our old gang of uh, Bureau Happold and Philips Favrag Smollenberg, uh, a, a, a wonderful team. Um, this is what you see when you go to Pungol right now, uh, and it's a bit relentless, he said politely. Um, I come from the town of, of Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs used to, everybody thinks Jane Jacobs is a New Yorker, but she lived most of her life in Toronto, just a couple of streets away from me. Uh, and she had a, you know, she really still said a few things that are absolutely true. Uh, and one of them is short blocks, not long blocks. Always create short blocks. Uh, she said, always have a mix of, she preferably would like to have a mix of old and new, but a mix of different heights and densities and types of buildings. Uh, don't create the, this kind of uh, repetitive format, um, because what it doesn't allow for is incremental change. So when all of these buildings get old, they'll all get old at the same time. And that's not going to be a happy situation. Uh, so you want to mix it up so that, frankly, your city ages at different rates and at different times. And so, absolutely, it's interesting. She was not an architect or a planner. Um, I, saw, I remember being on a, on a speaking engagement with her once, and she said, I'm not an architect, I'm not a planner. I barely graduated from high school. Um, but she had a fantastically intelligent way of thinking about things. Um, so when we looked at this, uh, we said to ourselves, uh, this is our competition entry, um, what we need to do is move from coarse grain of a very uh, fat lattice of streets to a very fine grain. Uh, we need to move from that relentless built form to a diverse and flexible built form. Uh, from one great water's edge spine to uh, a, a rich network of public spaces. So again, trying to break up the block as we were expanding Pungol down to the water's edge. Uh, we need to move from that single purpose infrastructure into a much more integrated multi-purpose network. Uh, from a daytime exodus, everybody leaves, goes to work, uh, to uh, a 24-7 employment uh, and visitor destination where people can work uh, nearby where they live. Um, and from forward-looking sustainability targets to very much a waterfront garden city uh, which incorporates sustainability. Um, so that was the plan that we, uh, that, that we uh, e ended up with. And uh, as I say, we had to solve in the macro 
but you also always have to solve these problems. You do need to get down to architecture at a certain point and make sure that this actually works, that you can carry the density, carry the parking, uh, carry uh, the street edge. So I'm just going to close with a few brief observations uh, uh, about Singapore and where I think you might uh, uh, productively uh, uh, go forward. And interestingly, it comes back to that first where in the world is Singapore discussion. What I think you need to do is you need to move from big to small. Um, you are doing uh, amazing things. Uh, I mean, this is the most ridiculously wonderful building there ever was. Okay, and it is put. I mean, it is. It sends a fantastic message about creative, how creative, innovative, uh, and how you can have two ridiculous ideas at the same time, which is people swimming on the 50th floor, um, and. I also have to say that I think a lot of the architecture, uh, I went for a long walk around again yesterday uh, just to refresh myself, and I mean, you have done some really great stuff here. There is, app, there is a just marvelously uh, innovative and interesting looking uh, high intensity architecture. Um, but you've also done some stuff that is just a tad too heavy. Uh, and this is, I, I must admit, makes me a little bit nervous uh, when I look at this. Um, and there are a bunch of things going on here that if you imagine this extrapolated all the way down to the waterfront, um, I'm not sure you're going to like uh, what you've got. Um, it, it has to do with uh, both the massing and the monochromatic quality uh, of it, uh, but it also has to do with street relationships uh, at the micro, which aren't working very well. Uh, and it's a truism to say high density that succeeds or fails at the street. Uh, and uh, this is where uh, you have to make it work. Um, and you know, I'm not sure it's clear that it is working right now. I have to tell you another interesting thing, and I'm more and more convinced of, is I'm full of admiration for your, all of your car management uh, policies. I, I mean, they, every other city in the world would die for, for how aggressively anti-car you are. Um, but one of the crazy things is you don't have any traffic. You really don't have any traffic in this town. So my proposition number one is to take a lane out of every single major street because you've got too much asphalt. Uh, <laughs> look at that, okay? That's too much asphalt. So here's the right amount of asphalt. Um, any of you who've been to New York lately will know that essentially what they have done there is they have retired great chunks of their road system are in Central Park, but they've also taken great chunks of their road system out for bike lanes. Um, so all of the avenues have basically had one uh, lane of traffic removed. Um, this is very interesting, counterintuitive, but uh, has there been any downside to this? Au contraire, there's been a huge upside to it. People are having a lot of fun. Um, and at the same time, what does New York do to make all of that density work? They spend a lot of time on the micro. Uh, these beautiful spaces that they make all around. Uh, now, you need no education on how to make the micro work. Uh, you've got lots of high quality smaller places. Uh, and I, I love eating in these markets, one across the road here, it's fantastic. Um, and this is my favorite restaurant in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, and, uh, but what's interesting is one of the reasons this works is, as I understand, I've probably got the little history wrong on this, but Sir Stanford Raffles said, Five foot step back, please, everywhere. You need to start to come up with some similar rules for your high density areas, and particularly that made, uh, Marina Bay area. This is 57th and Madison, a big office district right in the middle of New York City. Uh, here they have taken uh, one of the street that lanes out for, for bikes. There's a lot of traffic, but the whole street edge is vibrant, is active, is, it, it works. There's no reason you, there's no not tension between activity uh, and congestion and, uh, and urban activity. In fact, I think congestion is your friend. You actually want to slow stuff down a little bit here and create a bit of congestion. Um, Canary Wharf, uh, very interesting what they've done to absorb that density at the grade. Uh, you're looking right now at, uh, at the end of the photograph is the uh, Canada Square Tower, the highest tower. Uh, but very pleasant micro environment, working very well animated activated uh, sidewalks. And another one uh, right ne near to City Hall in London uh, called More London, uh, where 
They've just managed to tighten the district, very narrow uh, walkways, because as it was pointed out to me before, you really do have to worry about uh, uh, climate moderation and, and, and your unique climate. When you, when you talk about your unique climate, I'll talk about my unique climate one day. Um, but uh, this, so th there are ways of, of doing this and doing it well. So that's your challenge for the next while. And thank you. And uh, I'd be happy to open and answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Barrich, for your insightful presentation. Let us now invite both speaker and moderator up on stage for the question and answer session. Dear all, during the question and answer, please state your name and organization before asking questions or making comments. You might like to raise your hand and our staff will walk to you with a handheld microphone. May I invite to the stage Mr. Barrich and Mr. Ching. Thank you. Right, thank you, uh, Mr. Barish, for the wonderful presentation. I'm Tuan Yi from the URA, and I think uh, his presentation strikes a chord uh, personally for me, and a lot, because um, I'm with the team that uh, deals with the city centre and plan for the Marina Bay area. And uh, we really do welcome ideas and discussion on this, because I think what he has uh, rightly pres uh, presented and touched upon are some of the questions that we are grappling with. And the way that uh, I think we have uh, engaged um, views from the industry, consultants, and even from the stakeholders and public, I think this is a continual uh, engagement that we want to have to continually be able to improve our plans. And I definitely love the analogy of the chess pieces. And chess is a slow game, just like planning, <laughs> right? And uh, it's uh, getting the pieces and the right moves over time in the right way just to, to, to win. So I have a couple of uh, thoughts and questions um, and I thought that I could just uh, start with the first question um, to pose to Mr. Barish and then we could open the, it to the floor. Um, I think um, one of the thoughts that's, that's going on in our heads is that uh, um, you open up the presentation um, with uh, this idea of a global competition and dynamics and a lot of that has been driving what we are putting in into our city centre. The big stuff, uh, financial centre, uh, integrated resort, gardens, the infrastructure of the, the whole promenade. And uh, I think uh, Mr. Bresch has very rightly pointed out that the next step we need to do is to go onto the small stuff. Um, there's another dynamic that's uh, a little bit uh, that I want to touch upon. Because um, in the face of global competition, global dynamics, uh, there's also been some cynicism and say that our city, the big stuff, caters and runs along with these dynamics in attracting investments, global talents, but there's something missing for the locals. And it is an uh, aspiration for our city to be both a distinctive global city and an endearing home. And so the cynicism is that, oh, this big stuff, in the city centre, it's not for me, it's not for the locals. What, what are your thoughts on this, Mr. Bresch, and what, what advice would you give to planners and uh, leaders of, of her? Um, I, I, I think it's a, a question that every city is grappling with, and the answer is different in every city. Um, is this turned off? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Um, it was fascinating coming from Toronto, I am giving the opposite speech in Toronto, which is that we are the nicest place to live in the world, if a little bit cold, um, but we had better watch out because we do not have the big stuff. And there's a tension between these, uh, between these big, medium, and small uh, components of a city, uh, and they all have to be there for a successful place. And, and um, it, 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 it's, it's a dynamic tension, it keeps changing. Um, you've now got a situation where London and New York are getting too expensive for any normal human being to live. Uh, and this is gonna be a big problem for them um, because it means that if you've got, uh, you just come out of university and you've got a fantastic new startup idea, you probably can't afford it to do it in London or New York any longer. So um, 
and it's worrying those cities, so they are having to respond to it. So the, the mix for, uh, and, and then as I said before, going to Sydney, Sydney's rather like Toronto. Uh, I mean, Sydney, I could live there, you know, go swimming every day and have a nice life and, you know, eat the bar, you know have a barbecue every evening. Um, and uh, who cares about global competitiveness? It's La La Land. Um, so, th but they, you know, they're a long way from anywhere uh, and they have to worry that they could just be a nowhere place. And it's very tough because whether we like it or not, uh, global competition for talent and for business does exist. And especially if you are an immigrant city, and interestingly, Singapore is, and Sydney is, and Toronto is, uh, you've, uh, that's what keeps you healthy is that endless refresh from immigrant immigration. Um, you've got to make sure that there are jobs and that there are places to live uh, for, for that, for the new people coming to town so that you can keep new people coming to town. Otherwise, you can end up like Paris, which is a glorious place to visit, uh, but, you know, frankly, has a very unlikely economic future uh, because it has not been able to refresh itself in, in that fashion. Um, so coming back to, to Singapore, uh, you have done the big things incredibly well. I mean, your airport is the best ranked in the world. You're the third best financial center, a fantastic university. Um, I, I think that the quality of life is a very important competitive dimension. It's right, you know, those are the top four, I would say. It's basically universities, airports, financial services, and quality of life are the four things that drive the modern city. And if you are shown to be slipping or a bit low down the ranking on that from objective outside observers, then that's the stuff you have to do. So how does your city respond to it? Um, I think you need to think a lot about arts and culture. Uh, I think a lot about sports and recreation. I'm not sure you, you're not known as a sporting city, and I may have this wrong, but I don't think there's a lot of sporting activity that goes on here. But that's, that, what's good about, great about sports is it's a, it's a very, middle, middle draw, you know, it pulls people in from very uh, low and middle income levels and they get really excited by it. Um, I think you've got to uh, make sure that uh, you don't just cater to these huge, big floor plate financial drivers because the people who work in them are human beings as well. Uh, they actually want to go and have a beer or they want to go and have a, a, a pepper crab or they want to go and do something. So you've got to make sure that that world is, 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 is there for them because those people are very footloose. They can go to Hong Kong if they don't like it here. Um, so uh, the, in, in terms of your question about the cynicism, because I encounter this a lot in Toronto, everybody says, why do we need to be globally competitive? We should you know, live for our locals. We should live for ourselves. Uh, our own healthy neighborhoods are more important than uh, new office towers. They don't understand the way the food chain works. Uh, if you are a city in the top dozen, as we both are, uh, you actually don't have a choice but to run like hell. Uh, but you need to run very cleverly. Uh, and I suspect that's how you need to change strategies now. All right. Um, yes, I see a hand there. Yeah. Uh, morning, Joe. I hear you from Wales originally. I am. I'll, I'll give the speech in Welsh if you like. But okay. <laughs> Cumbre. Gungri, okay. well done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful narrative this morning, very refreshing. I wonder whether you've seen our budget 2015. Seen your what? Our annual budget for the year. No. You should take a look. Okay. Because what you told us this morning, there's a renaissance, be renaissance, renaissance between your story and what we're going to do in the next, hopefully, handful of years between okay. 2015 to 2020. Uh, now, you, I, I, I know architects and planners love small, medium, large. Unfortunately for Singapore, it's difficult for us to either go from big to small or then small to big. We're actually doing everything all together. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd never be in competition against a global city. So even as we look into the grain, as you suggested and Tony suggested, uh, we hope we don't navel gaze and forget about the big picture and the big thing. And the reason I say it is because budget 2015, one of the major thrusts for the next 10, 15 years is to make sure we have a lot of opportunity for the middle class, the 20 to 80 no? percent. Now yep. that's a huge block. Yes. And if we don't address that, uh, the city is 
no reason to be around, right? So that's our main reason for going big, going small, medium, all at the same time. So I like your story, but some part of it, I think we need to rethink it a bit about your suggestion. Now. It's slightly different from TO. I know I spent many years in Canada. I mean, the Western literature, of course, has certain things. We from Asia read the Western literature with a grain of salt now. Yeah. A lot of good things there. We can learn a lot of things there. But certain things we need to deviate a little bit because the culture here is a yep. slightly different. Sir. So, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about your story. Is it? Uh, good time for you to chit chat with us a bit more, I think, in the next little while. So that we probably will learn a lot more from your experiences working in all different cities, not just Toronto. Eh? I mean, your experience is wonderful because you work in all kinds of cities and you haven't worked very much in Asian cities, so maybe you can start here. Yeah? Uh, I wonder whether you've seen the light and sound show at the Garden by the Bay. S uh -huh. Sorry, can you give me that again? The night show. We have a light and sound I... show at the trees. Yes. You've seen it daytime probably and maybe dusk, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe tonight go back and spend 15 minutes. It comes on every 15 minutes for about seven minutes, I think. Yep. It's, a, it's a wonderful light and sound show. Thanks for a wonderful story, Joe. Well, thank you. No, it's, uh, I mean, I have to say uh, that, uh, and I hope it came across, every time I come here, I, I am knocked out. I mean, I, I think what, what you have created is, is, is quite an extraordinary place. I also think, you also think you've created an extraordinary society. It's, it's your, your, your social innovation is, is just as much an incredible uh, a, a story as, as your, your physical innovation. When I tell, tell people the kind of HDB story, you know, 83% of people live in, in public housing and all, pretty much all the public housing is home ownership. They go, what? I mean, this is, uh, I was, uh, nobody, uh, this is incredible because every other city is, is struggling with these awful old public housing projects that they don't know what to do with. And I hope, I think you may have dodged the bullet on that problem. Okay, um, I see a hand in the middle. It's, uh, my oh, just, can I just come back to you? I'm glad you brought the story to HDB. You see, the last few years, I spent a lot of conscious time walking our heartlands, I call it. Yeah. Now, you see, we have a lot of very interesting fine grain in our heartlands. Uh, Expatriate may not know, but if you open your eyes, walk around the heartland, the small, medium things are all happening very dynamically at that domain, not in the urban center. Eh? Yeah. Now, if you think you don't want to drink in a, big, uh, in a place near your big floor plates, for us, eh, a handful of stations away, you're in Holland Village. Now, that's a wonderful, fine grain, very developed, bohemian neighborhood, but it's in the middle of a heartland, not in the city. Mm. Uh, so this is something you're right in the way we have done the social part. Uh, it is, we're still experimenting, uh, not there yet, yeah. but a lot of good things has come about because of that conscious effort to socially yes, yeah. develop it. Oh, it yeah, I, mean, I have to say, it, it gives me a lot of, uh, again, just intellectually, it, it's... It, it, Architects and planners tend to be physical determinists. They think that physical space uh, influences and drives and directs behavior. And you know, Jane Jacobs was sort of saying that. Uh, you, know, short, you need to have short blocks. Um, you come to Singapore and you can't hold that to be true because in, 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 a, in an urban design, which frankly, uh, it would be way more, uh, uh, I don't know what the right, polite right word is, but brutal, uh, than you would find in any other uh, Western city, um, you don't seem to have the same uh, social pathology that would be in those buildings if they were in Chicago or New York or Manchester. Um, and so the notion that there is this easy determinism is just clearly not the case. So is it your, the unique culture of your city? Uh, is it, in fact, the mechanism of making all of the housing ownership rather than rental? I don't know, but it is a, it's fascinating. Just, uh, it, it certainly, every time I come here, I would say it so stands a lot of things that I think I knew on, on, on their head. Um, so I, I am learning uh, yeah, when I'm here as I walk around every day. I think um, that's also sparked the thought in me, and maybe um, 
we could get some comments and questions on this also. Because, um, Mr. Barish, you just mentioned the parts which were, maybe I would call it the unseen pieces. We have seen the physical big to small ones. But uh, the unseen ones are like the, the governance, the software, the place management, and how we feel the pulses of the, uh, the globe, uh, the region, and within our city and communities. I think uh, perhaps there's uh, something more we could uh, talk about but later. But um, there was a hand in the middle. Uh, we could uh, pass the mic to the gentleman in the middle. Hi, thanks, Mr. Barrich. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm from the Urban Redevelopment Authority. I'm a local planner, uh, as uh, I guess that's what, what we call ourselves. Uh, so, so I take care of an area that is not the city centre. Uh, it's a neighbourhood uh, in the heartlands uh, called Queenstown. Yeah. Uh, and I think what you said is very wise, actually. Uh, the strategy of looking at big, medium and small. Uh, but it's clear how that applies for a whole city. But what if you are uh, in charge of a neighbourhood in a city? Does it still apply? Is it scalable? And the second question is, uh, um, to what extent do we have to determine the big, medium and small pieces uh, from the get-go? Uh, how, to what extent do we have to design everything, pre-bake it into a development plan and then let it run? What can we leave to the future, to the uncertainties and to the community to have some input and have a role in shaping their own uh, neighbourhoods? Yeah, that is a really good question. <clears throat> let, me, let me answer the f second one first. Um, there's a terrible desire, as you put it, to pre-bake everything. Uh, and, and to know exactly what you're going to do and to phase it. And, 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 uh, well, first of all, this isn't how human beings are. Second of all, it isn't how people are. Um, you know how uh, you can see in, in Western societies, every planner is endlessly trying to have active retail streets when people actually want to go and shop in big box stores. Uh, and so you, you fight that. Uh, at your peril, uh, and you have to be very clever about how you, you know, anticipating how, how people actually behave. Um, I think what's most important is to try and create uh, the, the possibility for flexibility uh, to accommodate uh, f future activities. W one of the things I'll tell you, which worried me when I went to Pongol, is let's say that you wanted to open uh, a uh, uh, a, a, a digital uh, 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 hardware repair business, you know, repair printers and computers and stuff like that. It doesn't pay a lot of money, can't pay a lot of rent. Frankly, you need a shed, not much more than that. Where can you do it? You know, there's, there's no space that's cheap and flexible and easy to do it because you've built the whole thing out. Um, if, if, if you want to start a restaurant, uh, where can you do it? Uh, it's very important in immigrant societies uh, that to allow for small business formation because essentially that's how immigrants make money uh, and then they lend their that capital to their cousins and their uncles and their, their, their nephews so they can make money and they can buy a house. Uh, you know, you, you're slightly different just because of your, the, the unique way you do your, your, your social management here, but in, in certainly in, in, in the Western world, uh, Capital formation is the critical activity for immigrant successful immigrant settlement. Um, if you if you turn your immigrants into renters uh, and employees, um, they, they will never be able to jump. And since they've, they've you know that immigrants have energy because they've taken this huge jump across the ocean. They've self-selected themselves to go into a new society. So that means your your physical world must be able to accommodate those human ambitions as they, uh, as, as they emerge. And, um, and what that means is don't pre-bake everything too hard uh, because you'll want, it, you, you'll want it to be flexible and change and accommodate that, that kind of stuff. Um, I do think, though, that you, uh, although the, I, the big, medium, and small ideas don't completely scale down, the, the, the theory of them does, uh, you, you'd when we went to Pungol, there was no employment space there. You know, for a very significant population, no employment space. Uh, there, there wasn't uh, a major high-end hospital 
uh, college. We don't have to go to you know university, but you, you need to have uh, big employers that that uh, uh, and medical institutions are very important because they employ everybody uh, right up and down the the, the, the knowledge range. Um, uh, you you it, it, you've got to be able to put those things in. Uh, I think it's very important to create cheap, flexible space, and usually this can be some old sheds that are hanging around. Don't knock them down. Leave them there um, so that people can uh, move in and do whatever the heck it is they want to do. You don't know what you don't know what activities they're going to be doing, but you know that they want to want to be doing some activities. So. Uh, those would be, you know, what I would see. Um, it, it, it isn't the same as the CBD, uh, the city center, but the same kind of mix, flexibility, scale, um, variation, uh, age variation, uh, activity variation, are, I th those rules apply. Yes, uh, this gentleman. Yeah. First, I would like to say thank you for your um, inspiring presentation. Uh, myself, I find a lot of um, wisdom in your presentation. Um, so my name is uh, Zung, working as a planner for CPG Consultants. And uh, I'd like to ask you for one question. <clears throat> as an Asian planner, but training North American, we pretty much influenced by uh, Western urbanism. right? But when we come back to Asia to work, we've been working in projects in India, Vietnam, Indonesia. One question really struck us that how we make those things not just uh, very globally competitive, but also have strong local identity and yeah. reflect the people values as well. So do you have any advice on that? And can you all, you can take your master plan you did for Singapore, Pungo or Waterfront, how those really made for Singapore, not for Canada or UK? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> I, part of the answer is I don't know, um, and it's not my problem, it's yours, uh, in a sense. <laughs> I'm serious. I can't tell you how to be the way you want to be. Uh, you've got to figure that out. Um, there are some pretty big drivers here. I mean, when you look at those great big clunking Marina Bay buildings, I don't know what floor plates they are, 40,000, 50,000 floor plates. I mean, they are being driven by a global dynamic about trading floors, uh, financial services industry. Uh, and that's not local, that's not New York, that's not London, that's everywhere. Um, so uh, if you want to play in that game, you, I think, I suspect, that's the game you've got to play. Um, the, uh, I, I do think that there, every city I go to, in, anywhere in the world, the most important thing is the street. Uh, and there are basic rules about the streets that make them interesting or not interesting. Every city interprets it in a different way. I mean, you, 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 you have flowering plants and shrubs and trees that I, 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 mean, I just love, I, mean, I adore. And I, you actually can't do tropical plants on the streets in Toronto. Uh, it's a little tricky. Um, so you, there, is, there is an interpretation that, that you, you, I know it sounds, uh, and I don't want to sound patronizing here at all, but your, your food markets, you know, the one outside here, the Teleatec, whatever it is, the other one in the city center, uh, these are unique institutions. I've never seen anything like this anywhere. Uh, so um, I, I also think that you, uh, there, there is a different cultural aesthetic there's no question that you, I'm, I'm, I'm staying in the, the hotel New Majestic, the New Majestic Hotel, I don't know if you know that thing there. That is very quirky, designy place. Um, it, but it's quirky designiness is you, not one you would find in another city. Uh, it, it, it struck me as being kind of true to place here. Uh, so I'm not sure you have to, to it, what you don't want to get trapped in is the kind of, um, uh, Nostalgia in a nostalgic view of what a city was, um, and I think you know when I go to Clark Key, I'm not sure. I think that's an area that, you, that in a sense, needs to get rethought as well because that's a highly commercialized view of of, of what you are. Um, you know, Bank Key sort of seems to me to work better. Uh, uh, so. Um, 
That's just me blathering on. I don't know the answer, uh, but I do know that you have to figure out the answer. Is there someone in front? Um, yeah. Hi, um, I really enjoyed your presentation, and I think it was very interesting to see Singapore being ranked to the different tables. But what I noticed was that um, Singapore stood out from the other cities as a city-state. It is both a country and a city in a way that London and New York aren't. And I was wondering how that bears upon the way that you structure urban planning and how it bears upon, um, you know, do you, do you treat cities like London and New York as autonomous self entities that can be planned or do you do take references to the rest of the country? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I mean, every city planner is so envious of your, you know, your one level of government. Um, no, I'm, I'm serious. I, I, I come from a federal country, a uh, very, very, very big country. Um, so we have three levels of government, federal, provincial, and city. Uh, and on the, the waterfront that we've been doing, we have three levels of government own the waterfront uh, corporation. That's the development corporation, so the equivalent of your URA or HDB. Um, and the, the guy who runs it said to me the other day, I, I've had uh, four prime ministers, six premiers, and five mayors, you know, in the time that I've been doing, in the last 12 years. Uh, and you, you can't get these guys to agree on the time of day. Uh, I mean, it is just, it drives you insane. Um, and they all tank, they, everybody is always having an election. Um, so, you know, these political considerations just drive in all the time. Um, so, the, the, you know, the, the utter ease with which you can connect the brain, the wallet, and the arm uh, is fantastic. Uh, and I, I think as well, you have not, obviously therefore you say this is something that you could abuse by being you know, too quick and too brutal and too heavy and too hard-handed. It, I mean, it doesn't seem to me that that's been the case, which is also you know, to, uh, to a worrying degree, which is, which is also good. What you are seeing is that the cities of the world are moving more like Singapore rather than the other way around. Uh, so, uh, London uh, essentially amalgamates 54 boroughs into the Greater London Authority and puts a mayor, just, and I only did this a decade ago, uh, a, a mayor in charge of it who is responsible for big. So he's responsible for uh, big industry, big economic development, uh, big uh, infrastructure, big transportation. He does big, big airports, etc. You see Bloomberg in New York, who again I think has, has been the most extraordinary mayor, um, saying, uh, "I'm going to I'm going to drive the agenda as a as an economic development agenda. I want New York to." I mean, he's he, it's hilarious when you go to New York and London and you hear their senior uh, uh, officials worrying about whether or not they can keep well keep being world class. <laughs> you see, what London and New York are worried about being world class? They are. They are dead because they, are, they see the downsides. And so uh, uh, Manchester is the most fascinating place in London because that's, a, in England, that's a mid-sized city. It's only about uh, sort of two and a half million metropolitan. Um, and they've been by far and away the most uh, successful British city outside of London because they have uh, created a very strong central uh, directive administration. So uh, the conclusion you come to is that this kind of soft dictatorship is a good thing for cities. Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, a, 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 it, it has its downsides. But if you are in the top dozen or top 20, um, it is probably the system that you have to have because uh, when we, I'll just finish with this, but when we started the uh, waterfront in Toronto uh, 12 years ago, uh, we did an analysis of all the approvals we needed uh, to get the project work and we came to the conclusion we needed 347 environmental assessments, separate environmental assessments. That's what happens when you have that uh, division of power. Uh, and that, that, so. Uh, I'm sure everybody here will find all kinds of problems with the system you've got and chafe against you know, the, 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 its unitariness and top-downness, but um, you should contemplate the alternative. Yes, uh, the gentleman. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Uh, my name is Karthik. I'm from CPG Consultants. Um, 
My question to you is about um, how do you plan cities moving forward, right? I mean, uh, like my colleague Zoom said, we do work in uh, cities like India, um, in, in Singapore, in, in Vietnam, in China. Um, the development of all these countries are at different levels, right? So our recommendations are uh, relevant to the, the economic activity there is and all of those things, right? But what we see in most of the developed uh, cities or countries is that, uh, which is also for me personally, which is, which, which, uh, uh, is an observation I made in Singapore, is that I, I, I lived in Boston for eight years, right? Uh, I loved Boston for one reason, which I, uh, I cannot say that I do in Singapore, is that the city uh, uh, was um, promoting more of entrepreneurship in the sense of innovation, right? Yeah. The top down is good. Right, but it also doesn't uh, move in the sense of the progressive city. Moving forward, um, I think just last week I heard something from an EY report, Ernst and Young report, which is saying that uh, they're not only looking in terms of sectors, the big, the big sectors. They're also looking at a sector that is really emerging, which is uh, the small entrepreneurs. Right? How do cities really going forward as planners and designers? How do we think about that? You know, that's that talks about sustainability. Yep. You know, we can't just plan for these really large things, which, which are not flexible. Yep. You know, they occupy, not only occupy large pieces of land, large tracts of land uh, at the waterfront or the critical parts of the city, but they're not really flexible. And if these progressive cities have to be formed, which are, you know, uh, where the people want to be uh, entrepreneurs themselves, they're all individual people, you know, eventually, of course, wanting to be the Bill Gates of the world. But uh, how do you plan for them? No, you're dead right. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Think how many examples I gave of those ports, you know, those, those big abandoned uh, 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 port lands in every single city. Uh, and that was the technology uh, essentially of, uh, you know, from the ni late 19th century up to uh, suddenly the invention of the container in 1967, and bang, it's all over. Now, is that going to happen to all those great big towers uh, down at the foot of Marina Bay? Um, is there some whiz-bang technology that makes all uh, bankers uh, uh, redundant? That <laughs> um, would be an interesting thing. But uh, I, I think you are dead right. Human ingenuity is what drives cities. Uh, and, 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 what, and what increasingly will drive the economy. And human ingenuity will need different physical th things to be ingenious in. Uh, but initially, they're going to be small. You know, they're going to be the Hewlett Packard garage, uh, suburban garage, where you start. They're going to be the, uh, uh, you know, that sharp center in Manchester, the old TV factory. It was fascinating. You used to make TVs. Now, you know, all the TVs are made uh, uh, everywhere else but in, in Europe. Uh, so what they make there is ideas. Uh, and some of these ideas, it's, it's really interesting, they've discovered uh, don't need the ping pong table and the, uh, and the cafe bar anymore. They actually need bigger, proper, more finished office space. So they, they graduate from the container, shipping container, up to uh, a, a better quality of space. So, so the institution that runs that uh, sharp center is now actually offering different premium office uh, incubator environments. Um, I do think that uh, I'd be fascinated to see, as, as again, I don't know enough about it, but as I understand, the next phase of Biopolis is Mediaopolis. Um, and my, I've seen a few of these innovation centers that are very high tech and very high service level and very high quality and therefore very high rent are taking a bit of a dive. Um, because actually people would prefer to go and work in the shed and in the warehouse uh, because they want to put all their money into the idea, not their money into rent. Um, so this is all, again, just uh, be caring. Like you, you, you need, this is why big, medium, small. You need them all. They're always in tension. Uh, they, they will always, uh, one will be more dominant than the other. Uh, but it is, and I think you got the sense of this, m my sense of, Again, and I, I'm, I'm an appalling kind of carpet bagger ob observer of Singapore, but uh, it is small that you need right now. Um, there's a gentleman in black, yeah. And after that, we can have. Uh, Hello. Yeah, my name is Ashwin. Uh, I'm from Bombay Studio. Um, 
I wanted to talk about the city and the region. Um, more importantly, uh, I mean the metropolitan region of, of cities, which could go beyond borders, beyond uh, countries. For instance, uh, I earlier studied at uh, at Sweden in in Lund. Uh, could could you speak Copenhagen. up a little bit? Sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was talking about uh, wanted to talk about cities and the regions or the metropolitan areas that they are part of and they depend upon a lot actually. So uh, rather than looking at cities as independent identities um, which are well manufactured and well controlled or, or well preserved, uh, to see how, how much of that power could actually divulge or uh, you know, let go of, of control to, to the suburban uh, districts which, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm coming from uh, uh, Copenhagen region, where it's a transnational uh, uh, region because between Ch Denmark and Sweden, yeah. looking at different cities, yep. and they don't compete against each other to come up with uh, a regional identity as well. Uh, so something that I think even Singapore is is also uh, looking at, or maybe is not looking at. I don't know. Uh, with Iskandar, that you also had a project there. Uh, with Johor. Okay, if Marina Bay Sands can be built there, Malaysia can do it five times more, cheaper, faster, better maybe, I don't know. And that's also a competition, but at the same time, how do they hold hands and, and look like a transnational uh, metropolitan? I mean, yeah. what are the dynamics there about the big, yeah. the small? No, I think you, you, uh, it, it's a very interesting question because, again, it's, it's, it's the downside of, of uh, the fact that you are such a compact city region, which has been a, a, a huge advantage and a, a, a unitary state. Um, you are bigger, Singapore is bigger than Singapore now, very clear. When you fly in, you can see that, and we did that work uh, in Iskandar. You know, uh, um, and this sets up a, a, a fascinating dynamic about how you actually manage the, the economic geography, which is contradictory or clashing with the political geography. Uh, in Toronto, we have the town of Buffalo, which is uh, an hour and a half away. Uh, and it's dying on its feet, rather like Detroit. Uh, actually, it's not. It's actually coming back off its feet, unlike Detroit right now. But the place that's really suffered very badly. But it's across a, what is actually a very tricky international border now, which is the American border. Uh, and uh, But we are, as, as a firm, we now, that's part of our territory. We work there uh, and we're probably the, you know, one of the biggest planning firms in upstate New York uh, because it's very close. We can drive there. Uh, so I do think you need to figure this one out. It's a huge advantage to you because it solves the problem that every city's going to have that's a success, which is that you're too successful and you're, you're too expensive and you can't do ordinary cheap things, uh, inexpensive things anymore. Um, and this is a big problem for London and New York uh, that they're going to you know, increasingly, they are spinning off all kinds of activities to uh, f more distant cities. The one, uh, the glue in the modern urban region is the airport. So uh, basically, I always like to say a, 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 an urban region is defined by a one hour drive from the airport because it's that that gives you the international competitiveness without which a city can't be successful. So, and, and this spiky thing is going on more and more and more. So if you, if you look across the states, uh, there are places like St. Louis and Minneapolis and, and Cleveland, uh, Philadelphia, that used to be really important cities uh, that sadly aren't anymore. Uh, and their airports have sort of withered away. Uh, so there are fewer and fewer airports that are really, uh, you know, there's really only probably three or four airports in the States right now, which are capable of supporting a truly international competitive city. Um, you have a fantastic airport here, so that, uh, it, you know, that's what everybody just across the, the Straits needs in Malaysia. They need access to that. Um, you can see the same thing happening in Hong Kong. Obviously, it's slightly different there politically, but, uh, you know, the, the great penumbra of Hong Kong, uh, Shenzhen, uh, being a part of that. Uh, but I do think that's happening. We're moving into, into very different uh, economic and political territory, and the, the political institutions are always way behind the economic realities. And, and it's they that have to change. OK, the gentleman in front. Um. I'm Bruno Wildermut, <coughs> a retired transport planner. 
I'd like to go back to your previous question, basically, how does Singapore, with its high, very high property prices, find space for these activities that look for cheap uh, accommodations, simple sheds that you can do a new development? Because that's one of the things that I believe is missing in Singapore, and the way the economy is changing, the way, uh, you know, the internet and things bringing about new kinds of ways of doing business. How do you uh, allocate some spaces that can become cheap spaces? Yeah, I, uh, first answer again, don't know. Um, but uh, second answer is uh, you have probably the Brooklyn Hoboken solution. You need to, your New Jersey is called Malaysia. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, you know, and originally before that it was called Brooklyn or Williamsburg uh, on the other side of the river. Um, that's where the cheap space is for New York City. Uh, and um, probably that's going to be one of your realities. But with East Kandahar, or even there, there's no more cheap space, relatively speaking. Yeah. I mean, it's cheaper than Singapore, but it's become also quite expensive. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, 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 I have to say again, I really don't know. <laughs> All I know is when I was, you know, I come into land and I look down and I see some cheap space. <laughs> um, I'd like to touch on this point on uh, the region as well as um, your, your earlier point, Mr. Berich, on the connectivity um, from the airport. Now, uh, we, we know that uh, Singapore and Malaysia are contemplating the possibility of a high-speed rail uh, connectivity. And perhaps it may not be so well developed in North America, but we've seen some successes in, in Europe and other yeah, cities no, and so on. How, how do you think um, this could change the game? and? How should Singapore capitalize this on, yeah, on, on this? I think this, this is very important, and I, I'm being a bit flipped there, but uh, it, it, it's, it's fascinating to me to watch the, the, the effect of high-speed rail in Europe. Um, and again, I'm working in Manchester. Uh, when I started working in Manchester 30 years ago, it was three hours, three and a bit hours from London by train. Uh, now it's two hours from London by train, and they are proposing to put in high-speed two, uh, between London and Manchester, it'll be an hour and 15 minutes from London. And uh, this has really been a huge, uh, 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 engendered a tremendous amount of economic activity. So it's a basically a, a basic economic fact that if you put in this, econ this, this infrastructure, you, the, 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 the uh, more economic activity occur than would otherwise happen. Um, you, you, you're, so it's a, a very, uh, very useful thing to do. Um, and, and I think it's going to be a necessary thing to do. I think you're, I think you're facing the, uh, the, the, the problem that, of, of just making everything in Singapore so expensive that uh, you, you don't have the labor force, you don't have the, uh, the, the low-level economic activity that can bubble up into higher-level ac economic activity. I mean, this is why your HDB stuff is so clever, because actually it's a bit of an insurance policy against that. You can, you can price, you control the price of housing uh, in a way that uh, no other city that I know of does. So you've got a bit more uh, room on that, um, but only a bit. Uh, you do need to grow the economic geography of the city. And high-speed rail is a, is a brilliant way of doing it. Any more questions or thoughts uh, from the audience? Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm Huang from Urban Planning uh, Author uh, Redevelopment Authority as well. And uh, my question is uh, also related to the high-speed rail. Uh, our Prime Minister announced that uh, one, one uh, Zhong, Zhong uh, region is one of the possible locations for the high-speed rail. And with it, it could potentially be the second CBD. So given that Singapore is quite small, and uh, we are talking about this big, medium, small uh, methodology. How do we, how should we approach this design of uh, having two CBDs in Singapore? And on top of that, we are talking about uh, new growth areas and uh, decentralizing of our business. And uh, you mentioned uh, in Pongo, there's no employment. 
and putting in employment to the north. So how do we plan all these uh, little big items around the island and yet ensure that they do, do not compete with each other and, yeah. and uh, they can, they are done well. You're going to get another big I don't know answer to that one. <laughs> it's obviously something that uh, it, it, it's a very, very tricky business. People say, well, why don't we create another business center in Pungol? Or why don't we create another big business center uh, at the top of the island? Easier said than done. The reason these business centers are so tight and so compact is for, you know, pretty, pretty powerful uh, centripetal, uh, yeah, centripetal forces pull them tight. Uh, and it, it, it's hard to disentangle those things. Um, but I do suspect it's something you're going to have to think about. And, uh, and high-speed rail and where the terminus of high-speed rail is, is going to be a pretty significant driver of that. Yes, there's a gentleman with his hand up. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for your sharing, Joe. Um, Keith Martin from PwC. Um, I guess I'll think a bit more about the business of cities, I suppose. Uh, um, I think thinking about, and I was really pleased at the beginning of your uh, presentation, there was a lot of emphasis on demand, and then thinking about the key objectives and desired outcomes. I think whether it's a, a building, a precinct, a town, or a city, one of the key objectives is to find the right combination of factors to be competitive. So if we say we're trying to be competitive, um, we need a master plan that can be driven by or reflect a viable business case. And I think to, uh, my question is kind of working backwards, but we're starting with we need to be competitive. We need a master plan that reflects a viable business case and we need to understand demand that will feed that business case. So the question is, um, do you see or do you feel there's enough attention being paid to the challenge of demand analysis that, that I think I see as a, a key foundation to start this process to successful competitiveness? Thank you. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm speaking from really a position of not knowing uh, enough about this. When we started Greater Southern Waterfront, we did read a lot of uh, it's national strategic planning documentation to try and get a sense of, you know, what were the key things that one should be doing. Um, I, I, I th it would be really important to know, and I, and I don't know, what the projected financial services space demand is going to be for the next couple of decades. I mean, anybody who gave that prediction, you probably couldn't count on it particularly well, but uh, you know, clearly that has just been going gangbusters. Is that gonna keep going happening? I don't know. Um, so that does need to be thought about very carefully. You've, you've kind of put your eggs in one critical basket, uh, which is financial services. I mentioned before that uh, this is kind of uh, after dinner geopolitical talk, but y you know, it's very, clear to me, I'm, I'm going on to Hong Kong uh, uh, next week, uh, you know, things in Hong Kong will not be staying the same. Uh, and, and, and you could create a case that they're not, the, the future is not very rosy for Hong Kong, uh, if you wanted to. Uh, things in Shanghai are not going to be staying the same. Uh, and you could create a case that they are going to be incredibly bullish and aggressive uh, and try and replace Hong Kong. Uh, Tokyo, you know, who knows where Tokyo is going? Uh, so, there you are. You you're in that cluster, uh, and the outcome of that cluster will be hugely significant for you. Uh, but again, it's sort of like playing geopolitics. Uh, how that <laughs> how that actually is going to pan out, I don't know. But I am sure, and I hope that people are thinking very hard about about those questions. Um, what we took from those early strategic uh, analyses uh, was the need for the economy to move from a hard economy to a service economy. That has happened. Uh, you probably now need to move from a service economy to an ideas economy. And clearly things like Biopolis are critically a part of that. Uh, but there's probably now even a, a, a 
fourth move into a creativity economy uh, and what the space demands of a creativity economy are uh, are probably much more akin to a heck of a lot of small space than they are to a few big spaces. So, Can I just come back with a quick, really quick case study then, because we've just been touching on Iskander. A key uh, township in Iskander, Medini, uh, five years or so started life as the International Financial Center in Johor from Greenfield, so 60-story buildings, etc. cetera. Um, dumb and dumber, if I could use that term. International Financial Center next door to Singapore would be probably upsetting to Singapore. The dumber part is that KL probably won't allow Johor to be the financial center. So a lot of common sense needed around the positioning, not, not just uh, the economic forecasting as well. There's this idea of uh, the master plan being a uh, support for the unknown future. And um, coming back to the greater southern waterfront, um, I, I can safely say that uh, the key ideas, many ideas are, are now foundational to, to, the, to what we conceive of in, in this, in this uh, growth of the city. And one of it being the infrastructure. I think um, um, for those not familiar with the plan, uh, one of the key moves is uh, to move even the, what we have, the current alignment of the Marina Coastal Expressway. Um, one more time, as we are able to reclaim more areas from the port areas, which will then move out. But this process of moving our key trunk roads um, is not new. From Telok Aye to Raffles Key, to the ECP, to Marina Coastal Expressway 1 and then to 2, has been a part of this long-term planning of the master plan that allows this growth and the growth into certain uncertain terms that we know. So flexibility is, is, is something on our planners' uh, minds. Um, but um, what we also grapple with is that uh, sometimes when we adopt a master plan, there are things and pieces which do need to go in infrastructure, road network, and which do limit in the way that we are able to then shift around in terms of the physical structure. What, what are your thoughts and are there any advice or ideas um, to, to, to give us a bit more flexibility? Well, it, it is tricky because infrastructure is very expensive and you've got to plump and, and you've got to, you know, if you're, putting, if you're burying expressways or you're putting in new MTA lines, it is, it's very tough to know. You've got to make a really good guess about where they should best go uh, in a sense, they, if they're done right, they'll prove you right <laughs> because you know, the people will go where you've made the infrastructure investments. Um, you, you, you do need, uh, you cannot do sites as big as Greater Southern Waterfront unless you provide a, a radically attractive infrastructure offer. Uh, you can't nibble at sites that big. Uh, and and you'll you'll waste the asset if you do do that. And I showed a whole bunch of ones. You know, in, in San Francisco, 25 years. In Toronto, 40 years. Uh, 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 in New York, uh, Brooklyn uh, Bridge Park, uh, just sitting there uh, because they didn't do the infrastructure. You have to do that, and you just have to take an inspired uh, and informed guess about where the best place is to do it. Okay, I've been reminded that we have time for one last question. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Hanky from the Urban Redevelopment Authority. I have actually two questions, if you allow me. So earlier on in the uh, start of the slides, uh, you were saying that the top cities, New York and London, they, are, they seem to be more ahead than the rest of the pack. That seems to be catching up. So my question is that, is it that they have done the big, medium and small planning better than other cities? Or having a longer lead time than other cities to do this? Or is there something more? My, sec my second question is, assuming that every city tried to try harder at doing big, 
medium and small playing better, the competition will be most likely shifting to the top, top few cities. So the typologies of the cities will become quite similar. There will be a lot of financial centers, big financial centers, big parks, big attractions. So how can any of these cities then try and break out and become better than the others? So in a way, I'm trying to ask how sustainable is this thinking about big, medium and small uh, thinking or uh, philosophy about playing for cities? Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, I think uh, you know, a few cities have got a, London certainly uh, is, is admirable the way they decided, not very formally, but it, so almost everybody collectively, uh, that they wanted to stop going west and start to move east and, and Canary Wharf and then uh, Jubilee Line and then the Olympics and now Crossrail have all uh, helped them turn the, the dynamic of, of, of city growth from west to east, and it's very hard to turn the dynamic of a, of a 10 million city uh, around. Uh, and you saw Bloomberg move in and say, I, I've got all this abandoned ports, land, all industrial land, all the way around. Uh, and so he went through this massive rezoning uh, of uh, hundreds of acres of uh, port land that was sitting idle. Uh, uh, and f f as, as new housing opportunities because he wanted to solve the, the, the housing cost problem. Um, I think every, you know, in, in terms of, how, can anybody leap ahead? No. Um, I think, uh, you, you know, who, who are you going to leap ahead of? Uh, Hong Kong, Paris, London, New York, I mean, they're, they're all very established people. Um, we all we talk about competition, but there also is a huge cooperative thing to this. It's fascinating, your university, has been incredibly clever in forging uh, uh, connections with other universities. I know the University of Toronto and National University of Singapore have very tight working relationship. Uh, so this is not just competition, it's also cooperation. I th and, and if you're in the top dozen, and you are clearly, uh, you are able to cooperate in ways that, um, that are new. I think Singapore is, uh, has a great competitive advantage, which is that it's not in Europe and it's not in North America. Uh, and you are in a cluster of, you know, cities. You know, what's your relationship to Jakarta, to Bangkok, uh, to Kuala Lumpur? Uh, th this is a very important question that, if you play that right, uh, works hugely to your advantage. Um, so, uh, you know, th this, is, this is the challenge for all these fine young people in this room. Uh, they will have to figure out how to play the cards you've got, which are pretty good cards, uh, and every evidence so far is that you've played them actually remarkably well. Okay, so um, that's the end of this session, and uh, we'll hand the time back to the MC. I'd like to extend appreciation to our speaker and moderator. Can we have a round of applause for them? Thank you for sharing your insights and experiences with us. We would now like to invite Mr. Ku Teng Chai, Executive Director at CLC, to present our speaker and moderator with a token of appreciation. Mr. Ku, please. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our lecture. We thank you for your participation and do join us in our upcoming lectures in the coming months. Yeah. We'd also be seeking your feedback via email and would greatly appreciate it if you could take a minute to help us improve the lecture series. Can we have another round of applause for them? Have a good afternoon and we hope to see you again soon.